welcome to our sharing on the second half of St. John's Gospel. And we are now sharing on the priestly prayer of Christ from John 17. And I want to read some verses for you first. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. And through the power over all mankind that you have given to him, let him give eternal life to all those you have entrusted to him. So the power over all mankind, the particular act of power uh, that Jesus wants to be given through his sacrificial death is that he would be allowed to give eternal life to all believers. Uh, and that would prove both his union with the Father and it would prove all his enemies wrong, of course, uh, that they are going to try and slap the term criminal onto him. And they're going to kill him and try and put the idea of criminal into people's minds. So the Holy Spirit is going to have to uncover all that as we dealt with in chapter 16. So everything that Jesus promised in the first half of the gospel in terms of life and light and bread and living water, they can only be given after the resurrection. So it's a great act of power that Jesus is asking from the Father uh, that they would do together, and that is literally recreate the human race in redemption. So uh, the Father's glory is tied to that of the Son, because if the Son accomplishes this, it is going to reveal God uh, as to who he is in his great I am uh, reality to the world. Uh, and so the, the Father's acceptance of this prayer is, is him underwriting what, actually, what Jesus is doing. And of course, uh, proves that Jesus claimed uh, in the first half of the gospel that the Father and the Son were working in tandem together uh, for the good of humanity. So what you're looking at is the inexplicable love of God for the human race. I think it's inexplicable. We don't do anything for him. Most of the human race doesn't show any interest and very few show any gratitude for what God has done for the, uh, him. And yet we have uh, all of this love coming from God towards us. So God is shown to be the one who is love and life and grace and beauty. And we are shown up for the ungrateful ones that we really are. So it's in this uh, great action of the Passover that all of these uh, wonderful gifts and graces are going to be passed on from Jesus to the church. Uh, so in John chapter 10, uh, verse 30, we read, the Father and I are one. And in 1038, the Father is in me and I in the Father. So Jesus only has to close his eyes and all this dialogue goes on inside of him. That's like why I said it's like entering into the Holy of Holies to see this wonderful thing that's going on. And what do we see when we look at the Father and the Son in dialogue with each other? Uh, you see this extraordinary reality of the I am. The I am is love, eternal love, inexplicable love, infinite love. It's absolutely self-giving love, self-sacrificing love. Everything is to give life uh, and eternal life to everybody else. So God wants to share everything that he is and everything that he has with us. And yet we show ourselves to be so unbelievably ungrateful. It is really extraordinary. So the son's part in the process is to show this extraordinary love. And when we go into chapter 18, I will go to trouble to actually show you this at every single moment, that no matter what anybody does around Jesus, what Jesus does is that he loves. Sometimes the love demands forgiveness, sometimes it demands patience, sometimes it demands perseverance, whatever it is, but what he's doing is loving. And so, uh, He's literally being unveiled to us in a most extraordinary way. So the I am is going to be seen uh, in the passion and death of Jesus. Um, and so when he appears in the resurrection, then it's like as if this is just the, the final proof 
of all that he said and did. So the father's part in the whole thing, the son's part is to lay down his life and to sacrifice himself and to show by all his actions that he is love. And the father's part will be to justify the son and therefore raise him from the dead. So you, you'll hear in the Acts of the Apostles, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. So the, that was the father's part in it. And so what we are looking at is not only a, a union of wills between the father and the son, but a union of action as well. So let's take verse three. And eternal life, he's asked for eternal life for us. So what is it? Eternal life is this, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is. Eternal life means indestructible life. It means a life that death cannot touch. So that even if the soul is separated from the body, that eternal life is there forever. So it's a quality of life. It's a type of life. And he says, eternal life is to know you, the only true God. We have to stop a little bit on that one. With his universal authority, Jesus wants to give a most precious gift uh, to the human race. And that is of knowing God. Now, the verb to know in John's gospel is used in a biblical sense. It has nothing to do with information. It's nothing to do with reading a holy book. It's nothing to do with doctrines or anything like that. It's an intimate, personal relationship with God that issues forth in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. We've said that before in the final discourse. So to know you, what he wants is that each one of us who are members of his body, that we are branches of the vine, each one of us will have the same relationship with God the Father as he has. Now he told us that already in different words in John 15, 9, where he said, as the Father has loved me, so in the same way I have loved you, and that is the way you are to love one another. Okay, so to know you, the only true God, and to know Christ whom you have sent. That is to have this intimate personal relationship with the Son that you have with the Father. And you will have this relationship in the Holy Spirit. And therefore, a true relationship with God is Trinitarian. It's never just one of the persons of the Trinity. The three persons operate as one. And so this is not head knowledge. This is the heart knowledge of lovers. And it is the, the heart knowledge that comes from opening yourself up to the other person. And this is where I've been talking to you about the necessity for all the members of the body of Christ to have a vibrant prayer life so that they do open up to know the heart of God. If each one of us knew the heart of God personally and intimately, then the, the world would change very, very quickly. It's because the world doesn't see us as other Christs that it continues in its sin and it continues in its unbelief. So Jesus is aware of the fact that if his beloved disciples, the members of his mystical body, if they ever reduce faith down to book knowledge, it's all over. Everyone that belongs to him must have this intimate, personal relationship with God. It's an absolute must. And as you're listening to me right now, if you don't have it, get on your knees and ask for it. It's not difficult. If the Lord knows you are sincere, he will open up to you and allow you, he'll give you the very special grace to open up to him. So if you haven't had this intimate personal relationship, make sure you don't go to bed tonight without it. It is absolutely essential to the church's survival because 
if the church ever reduces itself to mere book knowledge and having degrees and, and so on, uh, then it is very easy for the world to infiltrate its thinking and therefore for the world to destroy the church instead of the church transforming the world. And therefore what Jesus wants is not lecturers. He doesn't want people just writing books or making television programs. What he wants is witnesses. And a witness is somebody who actually has experienced something and therefore what they are saying is alive to them, okay? Uh, so this intimate knowledge was actually promised by the prophets. And I just want to read uh, a little bit, not all, of what the prophet Jeremiah told us was going to happen at the time of Messiah. And you'll find this in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, but I'm not going to read it all. See, the days are coming, that's the time of Messiah, when I will make a new covenant, which is what Jesus is doing in this Passover. And in this new covenant, deep within them, I will implant my law. Now, this implanting of the law is actually, the law is God's word. Uh, this implanting is done in baptism and confirmed in the sacrament of confirmation. But it can die there dormant unless you open up to this vibrant relationship with God when it will all come uh, up into your consciousness where you actually actively live it and therefore produce the fruits of the Spirit and you become a useful member of the body of Christ. So deep within them, I will plant my law, writing it on their hearts. Then when they have this relationship with God, now these words are not in Jeremiah. When we have this relationship with God, this is what Jeremiah says, then I will be their God. In fact, not just in theory. And they shall be my people. In fact, not just in theory. That's what the Lord wants. And this is what Jesus is praying for here in John 17. And then Jeremiah adds, there will be no further need for neighbor to try and teach neighbor. They'll all know me, the least no less than the greatest. Because anyone of any age who opens up to God, God will open up to them. It's actually that simple. Okay. And so uh, Jesus is asking of us that if, if we want what he has, we know how to get it. So in verse four, Jesus says, I have glorified you on the earth and I have finished the work that you gave me to do. Now, I have glorified you. That means I have revealed you in my ministry. I have revealed you in the way I lived. I've revealed you in the way I responded to everything. I have revealed you in my teaching. I've revealed you in my miracles. I was revealing you all the time. Okay, so my work is done. Now it's for the members of the mystical body to continue it. Now, Father, it's time for you to reveal me, to glorify me with that glory that I had with you before the world was, because the way the Father is going to reveal his Son in this mystery of the Passover is to raise him from the dead and raise him in the ascension back to his right hand where he came from. Now, at the very beginning of the Gospel, we were told that's where Jesus came from. That was in the prologue. And now Jesus is asking for the completion of this journey. He descended, he needs to ascend again. So. Jesus is indicating that he's ready to go back to the Father because his work is done. And so his, his anxiety is for all of his apostles in the immediate sense and then all of his disciples after that. He will show in his passion and death, as I said before, by his responses as to who the I am really is. So in verse five, he says, I have made your name known to the men you took from the world to give me. Now, the men you took from the world to give me are the 12 apostles. Uh, 
And then on a secondary level, it's the 72 disciples and then everybody else uh, who believes in him. But first of all, there's 12. Now it's not 12 yet, it's only 11 until Matthias joins them. But when John is writing the gospel, of course, Matthias has come and gone as well. So I have made your name. Your name is the sacred name of God. And we need to understand that the sacred name of God is unpronounceable as far as the Jewish people are concerned. They usually refer, even to this day, they refer to God as Hashem. Ha is the and Shem is name. Hashem, the name. Or the scholars will refer to God as the Tetragrammaton because the sacred name has four letters, Y, H, W, H. Unfortunately, because we're using the Jerusalem Bible, the sacred name is there all the time. I won't pronounce it because you shouldn't. What we should do is simply say the Lord, or in Hebrew, Adonai. Okay, that is the correct uh, reverential way to speak about God. But when Jesus says, I have revealed your name, he's saying, I have revealed you. Because in the Bible, the name is the person. If I call you by your name, I'm not just calling a name, I'm calling a person. And so when Jesus revealed the name, he was revealing the person of God the Father. And it was very important when you realize that uh, when Jesus came on earth, uh, the Jewish religion had locked the presence of God in the innermost part of the temple where nobody could go into the actual presence except the high priest once a year. So I always say that God was in a maximum security prison. There were three veils separating God from the people. And I like to explain the incarnation as God breaking out of his maximum security prison and saying, no, I want to be among the people. These are my people. I made them. I want to be among the people. But the extraordinary thing is that the Jewish leadership were scandalized by that. God should be kept in his little box. So we have to be very careful as Christians that we don't keep God in a little box called the tabernacle, that we allow Jesus to get out among his people and allow all of the people to come to know him personally so that Jesus is walking our streets in us as living tabernacles and that Jesus is living in our homes, uh, hidden in the tabernacle of the family. That is what he wants. The book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 31, says that God uh, desires to be with the children of men, and he wants to be with the children of men. He wants to be among us. So Jesus revealed uh, all of this about God and much more, all of which is in the first half of the gospel. And he was able to do it for the people who had committed themselves to him. And the ones who had committed themselves the most understood the most. And we know that from the beginning, John was a contemplative and understood Jesus much more than the other apostles did. And Jesus says something very beautiful about the apostles and of course the 72 disciples and all the others who believe in him. He says, Father, they were yours because God is the creator of the universe. Everything is his. And he said, Father, you gave them to me. And now I'm about to give them back to you. Now, this is very interesting if you just follow the logic of what I'm saying. God created all of us, the whole of humanity. But humanity has rebelled against God and, if you like, has dirties its clothes with sin. And so Jesus, the Son, comes to the earth and cleans us up in redemption and washes us in his precious blood and purifies us so that the third person of the Blessed Trinity can come and reside in us. And he says, Father, now I can give them back to you. I've cleaned them up. It's really very interesting. Uh, the Father's gift to the Son. And only after redemption, the Son gifts us back to the Father again in this mutual giving. It is really a very wonderful thing. And so uh, this mutual giving of the Father and the Son is also glorifying each one 
that is manifesting this extraordinary love that God is. God is love, divine love, eternal love, infinite love, inexplicable love. And what God wants is that love will reign on the earth. We've dealt with that in the uh, final discourse. If love reigns on the earth, everything that God wants to happen will happen. If love doesn't reign on the earth, the whole thing will disintegrate again. And so Jesus is very, very concerned uh, about his disciples. They must get it. They must understand. And so the disciples are like a bride that are, is being prepared for her wedding. And this comes up as a major topic in the book of Revelation as well, the wedding of the Lamb. But we'll deal with that in another episode. Now I would just like you to keep the memory of God being inexplicable, infinite, absolute, eternal love. And that when you and I come to him, it doesn't matter what condition we're in, we are meeting this ineffable, infinite love. And if we have any sense, we will throw ourselves into the arms of God and surrender. Thank you for listening. Sloan August Bannock, they live. Goodbye. God bless you. Maybe getting you can't always. This is the death. Remarkably end. Turn back towards God. Rise up. <laughs>